Mrs. Caminetti? Here. Mr. DeFranco? Here. Mr. Donlin? Here. Mr. Jimo? Present. Mr. Little? Here. Here. Mrs. Menuez? Here. Mrs. Menuez? Here. Mrs. Wright? Here. Mrs. Mrs. Stella? Here. Mrs. Rogers? Here. Please can stand just, for the pledge. Can I just ask a real quick question? Was that Amy freezing or is that my screen freezing? Because Amy was, did anybody else have trouble hearing Amy? I Amy think was it's freezing me. on my I, I think end. it's Amy, me, it's it's my okay. internet was just unstable. Okay, so. all right. Okay, uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence for Richard Taylor, a longtime Middletown High School South football coach who passed away on November 14th. Coach Taylor was a member of the staff for over 10 years, most recently working with the freshman team up to this season. Coach Taylor made a dramatic impact on the lives of many student athletes during his coaching career at South. We extend our condolences to Coach Taylor's family. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic, republic for which, for which it, stands, it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. all. Okay, thank you. Do we have the student speakers from High School South present right now or High School North? We have High School North, Sophia Haberbrock. Great. Sophia, do you wanna tell us about what's going on at High School North? Yes, of course. Thank you. So, hello everyone, I'm Sophia Haberbrock, a junior at North. Here are some of the highlights of the past month so far. Junior Connor Kinch was selected first team All Shore and first team A North Division for boys cross country. Connor finished out the season running 1643 at Homedale Park for the sixth fastest time in school history. We at High School North have certainly been busy spreading holiday spirit this year. The Italian Honor Society has been involved in making and sending holiday cards to be de to be delivered to the Sunrise and. Sunrise Senior Aww. Center in Middletown for over 80 of the residents. The Italian Honor Society members will drop off their cards for delivery. The Italian Honor Society raised over $700 in online sales for their fundraiser for senior scholarship. They designed and purchased Italian Honor Society t-shirts for the first time ever for all of their members. Adam and Brunkovich, captain of the North football team, organized a food and toy drive after Thanksgiving. Ms. Jennifer Smith and her civic leaders sponsored a toy drive, and Ms. Ellsbury and her National Honor Society members conducted a food drive, all collecting many donations for Middletown Help Zone. Yeah. Peer leaders under the leadership of Ms. Cheryl Kroll and the National Honor Society under the direction of Ms. Ellsbury participated in an adopt Adopt a Child for the Holidays, which was facilitated by Ellen Hill and her key club members. Many families in Middletown will enjoy a happy holiday thanks to the generosity of the North community. The following High School North Choir members under, under the direction of Mr. Peter Isherwood auditioned and were selected for All Shore Chorus. Jess Ardelina, 10th grade, Sarah Buckman, 10th grade, Julia Bonaquista, 12th grade, Sam Cuson, 10th grade, Ava Gillia, 10th grade, Rachel Brodak, 12th grade, South Grover, 10th grade, Brian Ramirez, 9th grade, Aaron Sachs, 10th grade, Shannon Salazzo, 11th grade, and Sarah Welsh, 12th grade. Alshore Choir has some creative and safe plans for virtual performing and recording in the late winter and spring. 
Hopefully the students will have a positive experience making music together creatively and safely for this year. Oshawa will still exist for our students. The Middletown High School North Perform Performing Arts Program presented a virtual performance of The Matchmaker on Friday, December 11th and Saturday, December 12th at 7 p.m. Thank you for those who supported and enjoyed their first ever virtual production. North's TV film product North's TV film production has been very busy over the past few weeks conducting many interviews. A new edition of the North News, hosted by myself, Sophia Haber-Brock, will be released very soon. The student, government election, the student government election results have been counted, and the 2020-2021 Middletown High School North president is senior Paul Reinhold, and vice president is senior Bella Caruso. They receive 51% of the votes over candidates Michael Murphy and Alex Bogus. Senior portraits that were scheduled for December 21st have now been rescheduled to January 26th from 2 to 6 p.m. This year, the yearbook club with advisor Mr. Dan Alston has been continuing to work behind the scenes on this year's edition of Polaris. They continue to accept photos to be featured. Friday, December 18th, will mark the halfway point for marking period two. A snapshot of the teacher's grade books will be taken at, taken at 8 a.m. on Friday for the generation of marking period two progress reports. Progress reports will be released via the parent portal immediately after the snapshot. Tomorrow, December 17th, there will be an eighth grade open house and pathway night from 6 to 7 p.m. for high school North families. The Social Emotional Learning, or SEL, advisory committee is inviting the North staff and student body to join them in the Do You Want to Build a Snowman contest. Participants can submit their snowman designs to a moderated Padlet. They may choose to create their snowman outdoor, or if they prefer, remain indoor and create a tabletop Santa using craft materials and their imagination. Prizes will be awarded to the winners. Overall, we continue to keep high spirits as we continue our virtual learning. We are very grateful to be able to keep up with extracurricular, extracurricular activities during this time. From all of us at Middletown High School North, we wish everyone safe and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you, happy holidays. <clears throat> and Ty Hashemi is not present? No, I don't see Ty. No? Okay. Well, the next item on the agenda, Mrs. Walker, is the presentation for the outgoing board members. Okay. Um, Amy, you want to show a plaque? <laughs> she has a nice little plaque. We, we have a gift that you will all receive. Uh, we will have them delivered to your homes. Normally, we would do this in person. We're, we're sorry. This is uh, how we're doing it this year. But <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and Thank I, you. And I'd like just to say that on behalf of the district, um, and the Board of Education, we would like to express appreciation for our three outgoing board members who have contributed years of distinguished voluntary service to the Middletown Township Public Schools. Board President Pam Rogers, Vice President Robin Stella, and Nick DeFranco, your tireless efforts on, on behalf of our school community are deeply appreciated and valued. Among other contributions, Mrs. Rogers, Mrs. Stella, and Mr. DeFranco played leadership roles in developing the Middletown Township Public Schools current five-year strategic plan. They have made lasting contributions to ensuring that district goals advance our mission, which is to work as a united community to empower each student by providing an engaging, inclusive, and safe educational environment. Thank you for your support passionate dedication to our students, and the many hours you selfishly devoted to ensuring our district continues our tradition of excellence in education. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for a great three years. Thank you. Thank too. you. Thanks to my Thank fellow board much. members and the administration and teachers in the district. Thank you so much.
same thing. Uh, I echo Robin. This is an honor to serve. Honor and a privilege. Thanks, everybody. Pam, Robin, and Nick, thanks for everything. Thanks for everything you've done and uh, the time you spent. Uh, you know, hopefully you'll you know, still be involved um, <laughs> uh, as, as parents and as uh, residents. But thank you for everything. It was, it was great working with you. Thanks, yes, I want to say thank you as well. And thank so do you. I. You know, I really appreciate the past two years in you, um, Pam, especially, but also Nick and Robin and the work that we were able to do in the community and moving this district forward. I really appreciate it, not only as a fellow board member, but as a parent of a child in this school district. So thank you. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, Deb. All right. Moving on to our committee reports. Um, I think we want to start with the presentation from Malona McBroom. Yes, Mrs. Rogers, it will be part of our strategic planning strategic update. Planning. So we do have, I know Mike Zuba is with us from my Malona McBroom. I see him popping up on the screen. Uh, yeah. So what Mike is going to be presenting is a, a presentation of some conceptual scenarios that they have developed to uh, assist us in planning uh, for our enrollments going forward. And uh, it's been working with the strategic planning committee on this and uh, they've developed these scenarios using the rubric that was developed uh, by the committee and uh, discussed with the board. And that's what they used as their, their guide to develop these scenarios. So Mike, I'm gonna let you take over. Thanks, Amy. I'm going to share my screen and I know Rebecca will be joining. She actually, both of us thought that we would be getting on about eight and I know she's probably tending to some parenting duties right now in advance of the snow day tomorrow. So um, hopefully she'll pop on soon. Um, let me know if everybody can, uh, can, can see my screen share and I'll get rolling. All right, so for tonight, we do have these scenario planning concepts and they really are concepts. What we wanted to really look at was some high level um, building upon high level options that are building upon the strategic planning work, as well as the enrollment and facility utilization work that we had completed earlier this fall. Um, and we want to be able to put these out as various options to consider for consideration. And I do know that um, if to go forward, especially with some of the longer term ones, um, there'll be some significant work there that, and some questions that we just don't have answer to tonight, um, but we wanna be able to have uh, the community conversation started um, across the board on these. So with that said, I think when we look at the framework of you know, where we're planning and, and what we're planning for going forward, um, you know, we're, look, we're using those 10 year projections, we're looking at them at the various level of growth over the next several years. Um, and more so, especially with the early options, we're pinpointing where that growth is gonna occur. If you recall our presentations from back in, I believe it was October, we had talked about um, some potential utilization concerns, especially at Fairview, Middletown Village. We have some planned housing there. Um, we know some capacity pressures are, are gonna exist there. Um, so really looking at the shorter term view early on and how best to address those and then looking at the uneven utilization across the middle school buildings, um, and then looking at you know options for the high school with the projected enrollment decline really over the next five to 10 years there. Um, sort of the frame, the context of what our work is, um, you know, we're well, we're well aware of um, the various capital needs that are um, you know, enshrined in your long range facility plan that looks at those um, capital investments over the next five plus years, as well as some of the concerns in the district um, you know, over equity, especially with some of the different special ed and district wide programming. And really, as you'll see in some of our later scenarios, so as we get into scenario three and four, really sort of bringing in that one middle town, um, that one middle town um, goal that came out of the strategic planning process. So as we worked our way through these concepts, we, you know, looking both short term and long term, um, realized that there is additional work to be done, but you know, we're seeing these as viable conversation starters um, in the hopes that as the board reviews them, as the community reviews them, um, you know, they can roll their sleeves up and start to, you know, envision and, 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 and have a long-term vision of what things could look like 
um, realizing that there are significant steps to go through to get there in some of them. Um, grounding this by the planning rubric is something that Rebecca and I use throughout. Um, this was great to really understand those primary and supporting objectives. So as we were going through these scenarios and working with our team and saying, well, what are we accomplishing? Um, are we able to sort of, you know, move the needle enough? Um, these were great in helping for us to have that, have that tool there or that roadmap there to have that instant feedback as part of the process. So as we worked our way through this, we really wanted to sort of create these various families of options. Um, and as we put out these conceptual boundaries, none of them are set in stone. Um, they're more so put together to be able to understand a little bit of the demographic side, as well as what could be realizing that if any of them were to go forward, they would be, you know, further evaluated. So concept one really looks at and balancing the enrollment across all of the schools. Concept two is striving to attain that direct feeder pattern. So where you have split feeders with kids being broken off from their peer groups, looking at ways to be able to eliminate that within the construct of your existing um, number of facilities. Um, and then scenarios three and four, which we couldn't help ourselves, but had to have a couple spinoffs of the three B and C, um, look at some facility changes. And these are very high level. Um, these are changes not only in some of the grade structure, these are changes in your building's landscape. Um, and they could result in some changes in the educational pedagogy that's put forth, but we're really looking at it now um, from an enrollment demographic facility utilization um, standpoint. So really that early stage of facility planning. So as we tested these various um, scenarios, we revert it back to the 2019-20 data we know in doing the projections and just from doing you know, this type of planning work in other communities throughout the Northeast, um, that the 2021 enrollments aren't really matching up with you know, where you should be now or, or where you typically would be. So we thought, especially for those that involve different boundaries and different you know, conceptual redistricting scenarios, that this was the best enrollment where we have actually students placed and it re reflects really a typical year um, for Middletown Public Schools. Um, and then some of the other ones involve placement of programs. Um, we understand that, you know, as part of these, that we've kept all the out of area placements in the current buildings. Um, and we didn't make any assumptions about really, you know, digging into those programs or having major adjustments within those programs themselves. So looking at status one or, or concept one, um, we envision maintaining that status quo for all of the facilities. So um, you're not going to see any major shifts in the buildings themselves. It was really relying on a redistricting or a boundary shift in order to be able to balance enrollment across grade groupings. Um, this one aimed at addressing the future overcrowding um, for Fairview and Middletown, Middletown Village, as well as being able to level out the enrollment um, at the middle school level. So this is the first map we're going to see, and all the maps are done in a similar fashion for um, our presentation tonight. Um, so what we wanted to do was to be able to show what those conceptual boundaries would look like so that each school has been designated a color. Um, each color is um, becomes the background of what the new boundaries would look like. Um, and what we wanted to do was hash out the areas of change within the black bolded areas. So for concept one, we're going to focus this one on the new Monmouth um, Elementary School area. Um, the first area we're looking at a shift from Middletown Village into New Monmouth of just under 50 students. And these are all looking at K-5 students. Um, the second area of change is Fairview to Bayview, which that entails about 45 students um, would be moved as part of that redistricting area. And then New Monmouth into Bayview, um, which has about 40 students as part of that. And the last, which is more of a pocket area and a small number of elementary students there is Leonardo and Tanavasink of 18 students. So based on the 1920 enrollment, we wanted to look at what that utilization would have looked like should we have had those boundaries in place. So what we did was we tallied up the student enrollments through our enrollment management system, looked at what those um, capacities were for the buildings um, with that 10% headroom, similar to how we evaluate, evaluated the existing utilization and then looked at what the overall utilization would have looked like. Um, so as you'll see, we have 
colored in this cantaloupe color, both Fairview and Middletown Village, where those numbers are below um, what we would have as a typical utilization mark at 76 and 79% respectively. However, with the growth that's coming there for the future housing developments, that was the right benchmark for our planning with the growth that we're projecting there that would bring that number up to the uh, to the 90% utilization that we're seeing across the board. Um, for the schools that are slightly above that as part of this utilization analysis, um, please remember that we do have 10% headroom in there. So they're well within um, what would be that sort of optimal target range. Um, so that could you know either be looked at if this were to move forward um, in light of the current enrollment, but also as well as just exactly what are the classroom spaces that are necessary to be able to put this concept um, into implementation. So moving ahead to the middle school boundaries and following that same um, color coding pattern, um, we're looking at two areas or three major areas of change here. Um, so to the far left of the map, we have an area where we're looking at Thompson to Thorne and there's just under 100 students there collectively in both areas. and this is just solely looking at the sixth through eighth grade students. So um, not tallying up the, uh, the elementary students that would matriculate up through. And then the other area right on the edge of Thorne and Bayshore. So looking at a shift of just over two dozen students from Thorne um, to Bayshore and looking at this conceptual area of change as well. Um, so then moving into the high school, um, what we're showing here is right along the boundary um, between north and south, um, looking at an area change with basically really just looking at eliminating the, uh, the split area between north and south. We know that there's a, a choice program in place there and um, there's quite a mix of students there um, that opt in between. So basically looking at the redistricting to be able to capture those two areas of change, even that out to see what that looks like for the uh, for the enrollment planning. So when we look at the areas of change in light of uh, the conceptual enrollment at Bayshore, um, we're looking at an overall utilization um, where you have 78% for the sixth through eighth grade level. Um, we're seeing both or all three of the schools being clustered near that number um, with a range of utilization of 77 at Bayshore, 82 at Thompson, 76 at Thorne. Um, what does it look like at the high school level? Um, so basing it off of our utilization, I will note that in the elementary where we use the 90% of the max capacity, um, we have an 85% um, efficiency factor um, for the operational capacity at the middle and high school. And we do that largely to accommodate the um, scheduling between classrooms as well as um, the various offerings where you may have some lower class sizes based on the specialized offerings and not be able to attain a higher utilization there. But um, overall, we use the consistent methodology in all of the various concepts. So at the high school level, um, both schools would be right around that 100% um, utilization benchmark overall. So what this option does, it helps address the projected overcrowding at the elementary level and does provide room for that future housing that's on the horizon. Um, one option or sub option that becomes in play is looking at the pre-K programming at Harmony um, and looking at that movement as a way to be able to help further minimize some of the redistricting um, that we're looking at at the elementary level. I think one of the things from our experience that drives placement of those programs is really finding the most appropriate space um, and how you're going to operate it. So having the, the right space in the right location in the right facility um, requires some study that you know would need to be done, um, but overall there could be some further boundary adjustments there based on you know where those programs may land um, between Harmony Middletown Village as well as Nut Swamp to further facilitate this. Um, we looked at this in light of the balance of enrollment at middle and high levels, and it does a pretty good job of improving the enrollment balance at your upper grades. Um, we still have a split feeder. Um, however, and I think that was one of the things when, you know, even going back re as recently as last week and looking at um, some of the strategic planning, um, trying to get that one Middletown township philosophy, that was one of the detriments to this option is still having that split feeder going forward. Um, and we did go through and look at what those redistricting impacts would be. Um, and they are fairly modest um, at about 10% 
for elementary, 5% of middle school, and about 3% for high school. So going back to the overall rubric and being able to apply some scores in, in the shape of stars of where each of these um, different concepts um, performed, um, we looked at you know one through five on the primary and one, two, three on the secondary or supporting. And we see that you know balancing enrollment across all the grade levels, um, increasing efficiency, it definitely hits that medium mark. So right in the middle there, um, so, you know, this is really the low, medium and high um, sort of a, 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 be a better way to be able to qualitatively as well as somewhat quantitatively based on our analysis, judge these um, as well as looking at, you know, does it do a better job of providing a better educational and the least restrictive environment? It does um, score there in the medium. Um, 2A and, and 2C were a little bit more, more difficult and not really applicable to the scoring of this option but looking at being able to create a, an effective and adequate plan um, for extracurricular as well as your short and long-term goals, somewhere between a low and medium. Um, does it involve um, really looking at the facilities themselves holistically and developing a long-range plan in light of your long-range facility plan? Um, it scores low there as well as, um, you know, really eliminating and wiping out those split feeders it scores low there as well. Um, and then in the supporting goals of increasing equity and inclusion, um, it's really not a huge paradigm shift to where you're at today um, and does not make a huge shift from a diversity standpoint, either based on that option. So with concept two now begins looking at, um, once again, keeping your buildings the same landscape of your elementary, middle and high school buildings, um, trying to minimize the disruption by minimizing the split feeder was the real goal, trying to also be able to um, address that future overcrowding. So we begin with, you know, sort of our, our, our area honed in on Fairview, looking at being able to um, shift some students to the close by facilities um, to be able to mitigate some of that. Um, we honed in on a as well as a shift from Bayview to Navisink. Um, we held harmless the middle school boundaries and then we did look at a slight mod to the, uh, to the high school feeder pattern. So looking at concept two, um, we have two, re two main redistricting areas um, and one more minor. So starting on the left, um, we're looking at this area hashed out in black of a move of about 40 students from Fairview to Navisink. And then we have an area of just over 50 students from Fairview to Bayview. And then we have a much smaller area where we're shifting nine students um, from Leonardo to Navisink. So based on how the boundaries fell, you'll notice that we're still working against the same overall capacity. We still have the same overall number of students, um, you know, to have that consistent comparable. We're still at an overall 90 95% util utilization. Um, this shifts just under 100 students out of Fairview. Um, that's freeing up, you know, the capacity for the future developments. And what you'll notice with that shift in Fairview, um, utilization now has dropped down to 63%. So if this were implemented, once that housing um, begins falling in place, um, you know, that number would be a lot higher. But right now we're, we're, we're future proofing it for lack of a better term. Um, and, you know, leaving that extra buffer in there for those students. And then we do have that um, small area shift from Leonardo to, to Navisink. And I do have a note on here as part of all of the redistricting, we held harmless any of the former Port Monmouth students that are now at New Monmouth. And none of the um, scenarios are we showing or have, have shown in any of the concepts plans to redistribute any of the student body that's already been um, through a redistricting from last year into this school year. So as part of this one, there's no change in boundaries um, proposed for the middle school. Um, however, we do have some fairly significant shift of the boundaries for the uh, high school, starting in the upper right um, from south to north, um, a lot, very large section on uh, 343 students um, has been conceptually carved out there. And then from north to south, um, 140 students there as part of that conceptual shift. Um, so honing in on the high school enrollment and what that shifting looked like. Um, so taking a look at what the conceptual enrollment would look like for the for North, 
Um, just over 1,625 students there. So operating a bit above what that target capacity is um, with a utilization at just over 108%. And then Middletown High School South would come in at about 100 under what the maximum capacity is there. So coming in at about 94%. Um, and Fairview Elementary shifted to Middletown High School South, while Navasink and Leonardo are shifted to Middletown High School North. So definitely a change in the um, in the in the in the established feeder pattern there. Um, and then you know we did have you know additional shift of about 200 from uh, from in south into the into the North High School. So a pretty significant shift from how you've operated. Um, we also took a look at, um, you know, what some other changes could look like without, um, without really impacting the middle school boundaries and just looking at that, that, that feeder pattern there. So one of the plays on, on this one was just the shift from south to north of 343 students to try to really mitigate that overcrowding and try to find what would be that sweet spot. So once again, our goal for this was to work within the, the construct of the existing facilities themselves and use the redistricting options um, as a tool to be able to, to balance the enrollment out. Um, so what we looked at here, you know, in striving for that clean feeder um, was an overall enrollment of about 1,770 at Middletown High School North. So, you know, even though we were able to accommodate that balanced feeder, um, there would be, you know, some level of, um, you know, construction there to be able to you know, see that forward as well as some level of, you know, light, lighter utilization at Middletown High School South. Um, so that, you know, as we further tested this direct feeder pattern, we, we've come to realize that, you know, the way with having three um, middle schools there, um, that it's very tough to be able to have that direct feed um, from middle school into high school without having a tremendous imbalance in the high school enrollments themselves. So um, the general takeaways for 2 and 2B, um, really looking at helping to address some of the future overcrowding at Fairview Elementary, um, you know, a redistricting as an option can do that. Um, you know, a fairly small redistricting from our experience can be able to help sort of accomplish that. Um, looking at the various concepts in the shift to be able to better balance out the, um, you know, high school enrollment while being able to have these clean feeders. It's very difficult to be able to use your existing building blocks in the elementary school, as well as the three middle school system to be able to roll forward from an 11 elementary um, school system to a uh, three middle school, and then up into the high school while having those clean feeders and keeping all the, uh, all the peer groups together. So looking at our rubric for um, concept two and two B, um, overall looking at our ability to um, achieve enrollment um, balance across all schools and have equity and efficiency across all schools. Um, we scored this as a low in that regard um, in, you know, criteria or, you know, rubric number two. Um, we scored that as a medium for ability to, you know, have efficient educational operation and, and a least restrictive environment. And then having flexibility for future space and mandates, um, as well as that long-term facility planning you know, this is really using um, the facilities as they are with redistricting as a tool. It, it, it scores pretty low, um, you know, in that area. Um, scores a medium with the ability to be able to, you know, minimize some of the split feeder. Um, we're not able to score high and reduce it totally. I think we've, we've pushed the limits of um, just the, the number of schools and the size of the schools on what they can be able to accomplish to eliminate that. Um, and probably this is the best that we could do without moving into the facilities themselves. And then it scores low in the opportunities for inclusion across schools as well as diversity across the schools. So looking at scenario, looking at scenario three and four, I don't know, I think Rebecca just popped on. Um, yeah, I'm here. You want me to, to take us through these? I, I didn't rehydrate, so I was running a little out of gas on scenario okay. two. I, I know we had shifted what we, we had planned to do, so, uh, so no go problem. for it. All right, so concepts three and four, and there's a few iterations on three, are more of the long-term view 
concepts where we are working outside of the framework of your existing buildings. So we're making assumptions on um, consolidation of schools and new construction just to give you um, an inkling of what it could look like if you were to change things with your facilities. So concept three is consolidating from the 11 elementary schools down to eight. And we made some assumptions on what the operating capacity of those eight schools would be. We assumed um, a general education model of a four section per grade building with two classrooms that are pre-K or special class program classrooms within each building or a mix of those. Um, and so we would operate with 570 students per building in these eight elementary buildings. Obviously you would need to do a lot of work to get there. Next slide, please. And so we decided to just look at how could you carve up the district in a way that gets at some of the clean feeder pattern objectives um, as well as enrollment balancing objectives um, and when we did this, we were simply looking at achieving that enrollment target of, of evenly utilizing 570 student buildings. We were not looking at the buildings as they are today and making any assumptions on which ones make um, a logical choice for enlarging or adding capacity to in order to reach that 570 student benchmark. Instead, we were just looking at how could you logically divide up the district to um, evenly balance eight elementary schools. It happens that as we drew the boundaries for that, we did have at least one elementary school of your existing schools, I should say, within each boundary, as you can see drawn here. We just labeled these zones um, and numbered them. I'll just call attention to zone five, um, which is where Bayview is located in this map. And that we intentionally left um, slightly under-enrolled in anticipation of some housing development there. Next slide, please. And so taking a look at the enrollment snapshot of those zones, as you just saw on the screen, in it, um, with the 570 student enrollment um, model that we were using in the eight elementary schools, we've increased the overall elementary capacity by about 100 seats over what you have today. And so when we divide up the enrollment across those buildings, you can see that we um, have lowered the overall system utilization and we've quite evenly balanced the schools, obviously um, just assuming where those enrollment uh, boundaries could be drawn, not based on your current buildings. And as I pointed out, zone five was intentionally left a little bit lower anticipating increased enrollment there. And so with this model, you're able to offer some consistent um, educational programming across all schools. As we look to feed this up to the middle school level, we consolidated from three middle schools to two, where we assumed that the North Middle School, as we called it, could be on the site of Bayshore, it could be on Thorn, and the South Middle School, as we called it, could be on the Thompson site, and that we would be trying to split the enrollment 50-50 both larger middle schools would need um, to, to increase their capacity. They would need to house about 1200 students to accommodate the projected enrollment. And we would be trying to eliminate the split feeder pattern so that all students are flowing consistently from that north or south middle school to a north or south high school. Next slide. And so as we're showing it, we had a south cluster of four elementary schools feeding up to one middle school, feeding up to one high school, and then a mirror image on the north side. And so we've consolidated again, three elementary schools and one middle school in this concept. Next slide. And these are how the boundaries would play out um, based on those elementary zones that we conceptually carved up. And you can see that the south side or the Thompson district has sort of creeped up into the, what is now more of a north side. Um, and this again is using those four elementary zone building blocks within the north and south sides. And then they consistent feeder pattern, consistent zoning for the high schools, at high school north and high school south just point out as we drew these conceptual boundaries, it puts high school north at the very edge of its resident attendance zone. 
And again, we were able to balance enrollment, um, obviously making some large assumptions to reach that balance. Again, your operating capacity at the middle schools would need to be about 1,200 students. Um, and with that, you'd have a utilization overall in the district of about 95%. With North slightly lower, um, again, anticipating growth in that area. And then the high school enrollments also relatively evenly balanced at about 1,500 students each um, and relatively even balanced in the utilization. So, our takeaways on concept three um, you could invest in buildings to consolidate buildings and achieve some capital and operational cost avoidance savings um, by consolidating some of those older buildings. However, you need to make that significant upfront investment in the facilities that you would continue to use and would need to add capacity to. You are much easier, it's much easier to achieve the enrollment balance across all grade groupings, um, but you obviously would need to do significant redistricting as you brought those newer investments online. You could achieve a direct feeder pattern much more cleanly across the middle and high schools, but in the building sizes, especially at the elementary level, would help ensure the consistency in educational programming that you're able to offer all students. You would need to significantly invest in further study to implement this sort of plan, beginning with understanding your current buildings and sites and the feasibility of those buildings and sites to support additional capacity. Um, you also need to think about the future use of any closed schools and whether that they need to come into play um, during a construction project as swing space, or if there's the potential to reuse any of them um, in other educational models, such as reusing the middle school as a four section per grade elementary school. So there's a lot of planning and, and thinking through which sites make the most sense and how would you actually go about implementing to get to this concept. Next slide. So when we look at the overall rubric, obviously we were much um, more easily able to balance overall enrollment. So we scored this as a high impact, um, ensuring that all students have equal access to programming and activities. We scored as a high impact because by evening out the, um, simply by evening out the uh, enrollment uh, assumptions of the elementary schools greatly aids in achieving that. It's a medium on terms of creating a flexible plan to ensure that your facilities are adequate and offering appropriate space. It's a mixture of trying to use some of your existing buildings in the upper grades where also making investment at the younger grades. So we rated that as a medium. In terms of a facilities master plan, it is looking at doing some hard study of your existing buildings and deciding where to make your investments and for what, as well as um, achieving that better um, feeder pattern system where everyone is on a direct feeder pattern. Although we'll point out that it created a north and south divide within the community, which we'll talk about in a moment. And in terms of supporting objectives on increasing opportunities for equity and diversity, again, you'd have to do some significant redistricting in this sort of concept. So there's a high impact under concept three. We decided to take a, a few um, iterative looks at this concept and under concept three B, it's really the same concept as what we just reviewed, except that we looked at consolidating to a single high school facility because again, under concept three, what we created was a real divide within the community where North and South students may never really mingle. So we decided, well, how can we bring students together at some point? Um, we know that one middle town is an important objective. So we assume the same elementary and middle boundaries um, and the same feeder pattern as in scenario three, but we assume that there'd be a single high school that students matriculate into in grade nine. And so we still have a south cluster of four elementary schools, four elementary schools on the north operating at that 570 student model, both feeding into one middle school on north and south, and then feeding into one high school. Right. So the overall enrollment at a consolidated high school in 1920 would be about 3,000 students, but it's projected to decrease to about 2,800 over the next decade. Um, 
your two existing high schools have capacities of about 1500 students. So in order to oper oper operate as a consolidated high school, you need to either significantly expand one of your existing buildings or look for a new site in order to create a 3000 student building. If you were able to find a new site and construct a new high school, and that could leave you with two large buildings that could easily convert to middle schools. And then your existing middle schools could convert to those larger 570 student model elementary schools or possibly even larger. Next slide. <clears throat> so 3B was really to try to eliminate that north south divide by bringing all your students together. Um, it achieves that, although it would require significant investment and expansion of either an existing high school building, and you'd need to test the feasibility of that, or finding a new site and constructing a new facility. It would open up the potential for shifting grade levels in existing buildings, in other words, reusing your existing high school buildings and shifting uh, middle school students into them. Um, and again, you need to look at the um, sites and the feasibility of implementing this on a physical level, but you also need to consider the educational impacts and the operational impacts of operating a large high school of about 3000 students um, and see if that really aligns with the district's educational objectives. Next slide. We rated this very similarly to concept three. Um, the only difference is that achieving that single high school helps to eliminate that north south divide in the community, um, but all of the ratings are the same as what we went through for concept three. Next slide. Just a slight variation on that was, could we try to operate within the existing facilities and still have a one high school concept um, under concept three? So we switched the assumption to having a ninth and 10th grade high school and 11th and 12th grade high school um, configuration. So in our assumptions, all ninth and 10th graders would attend high school north and all 11th and 12th graders would attend high school south, thereby achieving that one high school but using your existing facilities. All the other assumptions in concept three are the same. Next slide. So again, we have a south cluster and a north cluster feeding into one high school. It's just that the one high school is physically located into buildings and they are your existing high school buildings. So the ninth and 10th grade building ends up with a slightly higher enrollment level. It's just, it's not uncommon for a 10th grade cohort to be slightly larger. Um, otherwise it is a relatively even split of enrollment um, where high school north um, would be just over 100% utilization in 1920 figures and high school south would be just under 100%. And again, your enrollment at the high school level is projected to decrease over the next 10 years. So our takeaways from concept 3C, it helps to balance enrollments at the high school level. It helps to eliminate that north-south divide in concept three, it's sticking to your existing facilities. However, it adds an additional transitions for students as they matriculate through the system. And you may have to think about the transportation costs and length of your bus rides and operating one high school that's in two physically separate buildings um, and what that means in terms of integrating construction, instruction and extracurricular activities um, across the grade groupings. So there's a lot we think of educational impacts to this grade configuration that you would need to evaluate to determine if this is really the direction that the district would like to head in. Next slide. However, we rated this similarly to concept three and concept three A and B um, in terms of, again, the elementary and middle systems are the same as concept three. It's really just about eliminating that north south divide and trying to stick within your existing facilities at the high school level. Concept four is different. It is assuming grade re reconfiguration and focusing on trying to um, make the, the best use of your existing high school facilities um, and trying to bring students together again in that one Middletown concept um, earlier in their uh, matriculation through the system. So we looked at, could you operate elementary schools that are a pre-K through six 
configuration with a junior high school that would be grades seven through nine and an upper high school that would be grades 10 through 12. We assumed that the junior high would be at middle at high school north and we assumed that the upper high would be at high school south. In this scenario, um, we would close middle schools to convert them to larger elementary schools. So as, as we'll talk about in a moment, we figured that you could um, eliminate uh, some elementary schools in this model. So you may be operating um, nine elementary schools in this model. It's possible that it could be eight. It depends on um, what you determine is feasible in those existing elementary, excuse me, middle school buildings. And then you would be bringing all students together at seventh grade. So you've essentially eliminated feeder patterns because all students would be in their elementary school and then all students would all go to one junior high school and then up to one upper high school. So to play this out at the elementary level, again, you're bringing a grade down into the elementary level, the sixth grade. So that total enrollment is about 5,000 students in 2019-20, and it's projected to increase over the next um, several years. Your current elementary operating capacity is just under 4,500. So you need about 500 additional seats in the system just to accommodate a pre-K through six enrollment. And that seat deficit really because of the projected enrollment growth is about 800 students under that projection model. So we looked at how could you reuse the middle schools to help um, minimize that seat deficit. So we assume that you could reuse each middle school as a pre-K six elementary um, to, to arrive at the capacity that's needed to implement this. We assume that each middle school could either have four or five sections per grade plus that two classroom model for pre-K and or special class programming. And when we looked at it as a four section per grade building, we added um, a total of about 1,970 seats to the system. We assumed an operating capacity of about 660 students per building. When we looked at the buildings as five sections per grade, we were at an operating capacity of about 815 students, which added 24, just under 2,450 um, seats. So overcoming that seat deficit that we just talked about that is um, arrived at because of adding sixth grade. Next slide. So again, under the four section per grade model, um, we have a need for you know, 5,000 students in 2019-20 projected to grow. We end up with a seat surplus of about 1,500 students. So we could accommodate the projected growth in the system. When we look at it as a five section per grade model, however, um, we've, we end up with a, an overall capacity of about 6,900 students and we have a seat surplus of about 1950. So significant capacity within the system to accommodate projected growth. When we look at this um, at the four section per grade model, we think you could close up to four existing elementary schools if you target in on the older smallest buildings within your portfolio. If we look at this as a five um, section per grade model at the middle school level, we think you could close up to five of your existing elementary schools. So the investments that are required in making the changes at the junior and upper high and, um, and your current middle school buildings would be offset by consolidations at the elementary level in this concept. Next slide. When we look at the enrollment of a junior high model, again, grades seven through nine, um, we're looking at about 2,300 students thereabouts and your existing um, high school north and has a capacity of about 1,500 students. So it's too small to support that consolidated grade grouping. You'd need to expand capacity by about 50%. Same, similarly with high school south, um, there's about 2,300 students in the 10th through 12th grade grouping, and your operating capacity is again about 1,500. So you would need to expand by about 50%. Next slide. So our takeaways from concept four is that you um, 
would need to make significant investments to add capacity at the high school level to accommodate that junior high and upper high model. Um, you could use your three middle schools as, pre, as large pre-K six elementary schools, which would enable you to consolidate up to five elementary school buildings in order to avoid those capital and operating costs associated with operating that many buildings. And you would bring all students together at seventh grade, which would eliminate feeder patterns altogether within the community. Again, significant studies required to implement this. And you, you would especially need to think about transportation impacts in this model, as well as educational impacts on this kind of grade configuration and whether they align with your overall objectives. Next slide. We rated this uh, against the rubric similarly to concept three, you're better able to balance enrollments. You've eliminated feeder patterns altogether. Um, you're looking at strategically investing in facilities and making consolidations. Um, and you're better able to uh, achieve diversity, equity, um, and inclusion by having to do some rethinking of your elementary um, attendance areas. So those are the concepts. Um, and I know we threw a lot of information at you. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions that we can help with right now, we're happy to. Is there any way we could see the maps? I mean, in the sure. first presentation, you know, the pictures of the colors, that's great, but what does that actually represent? What part of town? All right, so I'm gonna, I'm going to get on to uh, roll back time to go back to 40 minutes ago and get back to, into concept one here and focusing on the elementary maps. Um, Rebecca, do you want to do you want to talk through some of these a little bit more? Or do you want me to try to zoom in maybe a little bit? I know uh, we don't at this scale, it's a little bit hard to uh, hard to kind of see all the streets and everything. Right. I, I think what we do have and which could be helpful is um, pushing out to the board um, just PDFs that they can be really zoomed in more and not over this sort of streamed environment. Do you have them available on the server where we could open them up, Rebecca? Or is this something we want to be able to send out um, later and they can really dig in? I think we're going to need to send them out. Sorry, I'm going to say is it possible to put them in the portal for us? Yeah, I'm. I'm struggling. I, I don't. I don't want them in the portal. We're doing a presentation. We got people looking on, and it's hard to tell what you're talking about, where you're talking about. I mean, you I should be able to explain I, that. Joan, I don't agree with you. I'm. I'm looking at the slide that's on the screen right now, and I can see the little icons that represent all of our elementary schools, which we all know where they are, and. You know, a presentation like this isn't meant to get down to the street level. It is a conceptual presentation. And so I can see the line that denotes Route 35. I can see the train tracks. I can see Route 36. So I, I don't understand your, your, your question here because it's pretty clear to me looking at this on my iPad, you know, what everything represents. Nick, you were on the committee. I'm sure you must have seen the original maps. Am I correct? John, I've lived in this town for twenty some odd years. I know where the I know where the schools are, and you've lived here Nick, longer. You know Nick, where the schools I know, are. I know where the schools are, Nick. But when he's talking about moving so many kids from one school to another school, what part? What part are moving where? I, I, I believe, know where the schools I are. I've been to that, every one of them. I believe the point is that it's a conceptual presentation. No children are moving anywhere in the near future. The idea is that if you look at the slide right now, and again, I'm looking at something at the same resolution you are, and I can see I guess I'm the arrow that says then. Middletown Village to New Monmouth, 49 students. And I can roughly tell that that is around what, maybe the shop right uh, up past uh, where the Staples is and the tractor supply company up Harmony Road because there's Harmony School right above it. So that little neighborhood behind the swim club looks about where that is. But I so why mean, are we not saying that then? I'm, I'm, looking for, I'm looking for all details. I mean, John, at, my... at one point we're talking about moving Fairview to South 
when part of Fairview is right behind High School North, are we talking about moving the whole Fairview community to South? Are we talking about redoing the lines and moving part of them? Um, when we're saying we're moving um, um, sections to Bayview, what sections are we moving to Bayview? You know, I, I'm just trying to get a whole picture of it all. I have not been able to see the maps. This is just something I'm looking at and I'm trying to figure it out as a board member. Um, for me, and, and I won't be voting on this in the future, but obviously this isn't the first and only time we'll be seeing this. So um, what are the next steps from here? Yeah, and, and our intent wasn't to create hard boundaries that were, um, you know, putting dots where students are. We have all that information. We have every street, we have every parcel. We did not want to put out anything that would create something that was personally identifiable of where children and families are at this point in time. We wanted to conceptually show what the vehicle and what the mechanism would look like in the order of magnitude in the neighborhood changes um, that would have to be put in place um, should we try to be able to better balance enrollment, eliminate split feeders through a redistricting rather than go to a detailed level of student houses, this house on this street block by block of what would have to be redistricted in order to be able to implement it. It's more of a, it's more of a, a, a family of options. And this is one of the concepts rather than a plan that we're asking the board to take now and adopt and, and, and put in place. But with that said, we can provide detailed PDFs. We are just unable to do that in this. We're unable to share our GIS over the internet in this kind of virtual environment right now, which would allow us to do that, which we would typically be able to do. So I, I apologize, but we will follow up with these maps, but with more detailed streets on it for your um, for you then to be able to zoom in and out and explore it a little better. Uh, yeah, I would, Thank you. I would like to see where you got these numbers from that you're moving. It's, it's, I want to know how, you know, you know, how, you know, how many kids you're moving, it's, why you took that section and not another section. I'm just curious. Yeah. So, so all the I, options. yeah. And, and I can't explain our methodology. Our methodology is um, for all the options we're showing, we're using, the 2019 um 2020 actual enrollment with your students by address to conceptually show this we we've we've address matched them in our in our software we've put them all on the properties and parcels that they live on um and by looking at the orientation of the neighborhoods the proximity to um the neighboring schools so you will notice many of these changes um we follow our rule of thumb of being able to, you know, move to the next nearest neighbor rather than leapfrogging. So you'll see where we took those common boundary lines between the schools and those are the neighborhoods we looked at. Should one of these conceptual options um, be something that the board wants to move forward with, um, we would recommend a more detailed look and saying, boy, you know, is this enrollment today 40? Is it 50? What's it gonna look like next year? For this concept level planning, we haven't done that in deep dive. This is just to be able to be put out there some what ifs and get some reasonable answers to those what ifs. So, um, you know, please bear with us and we will get you that information. The other thing that concerns me is you're talking about the high schools and you're talking about moving so many hundred, two hundred, say 200 kids out of South, but moving another group of numbers into South. Are we looking at the least amount of movement that we can for our students? Because if we're taking 200 out and putting 150 in from another area, it, it almost doesn't make sense. So I think as you look at the breadth of um, concepts that we presented, they were all um, strategically focusing on different objectives that were laid out in the rubric. And so in some of the concepts, we were more um, focused in on trying to create clean feeder patterns. And that is when the movement may not seem to make sense on the face of it, but in, in the um, concept of trying to create that, fiend, 
that feeder pattern where students aren't in a school that gets split when it matriculates up to the next grade level, you need to make some significant movement. I understand that part. I understand the split schools. I think the whole community does. This so, doesn't make sense with the numbers that you're talking. I, I, I think, let, let's take a step back here. What, what Malone and McBroom have presented to us, and John, I'd like you to jump in here as well, but what Malone and McBroom have, have presented to us are concepts, not plans. And they've presented four plus concepts on a spectrum of low impact, which was concept number one, which is really just, you know, moving the, the and they, I believe uh, Mike had said, the fewest number of children, the lowest impact in order to attain a balance, all the way up to what I would call a largely radical for Middletown, you know, suggestion of utilization of, you know, splitting the high schools into 9, 10 slash 11, 12, going to a 7 to 9 and then 10 to 12 model, things that are outside of the box a little bit. And the idea of this exercise is to show the community what's possible, given both our existing capital infrastructure, as well as where we could potentially make capital investments. But at the end of the day, whatever choice the community takes, and they, they could always choose no option. They could always choose the, the, the no change option. That's always on the table. But whatever choice the community is going to take is going to be a refinement of one of these. And whether we decide to jump in with both feet as a, as a township and move to say a one high school concept and utilize North and South as then middle schools, or whether we decide it's more beneficial for our educational objectives to do something a little less radical and maybe look at consolidating a couple more schools or moving to two middle schools to fix the feeder patterns. This presentation is meant to give us as a township a flavor of what's possible. And so diving into this many students going from here to here, which students are, um, are impacted is, is, is a concern that's not part of where we are right now. We are at a point where this is more directional. As, 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 as John Little had said to us a number of times in our committee meetings, you know, we have a finite amount of money to, to, to spend and we have to figure out where we want to spend it. And part of that is understanding where we want to go. And if we want to go to a more consolidated district from a building perspective, then we need to focus our efforts on there. And what Malone and McBroon have done is, is shown us what that potentially could look like. If we want to invest in the 11 elementary schools that we have, and we are dead set as a community on investing in those 11 elementary schools, then Malone and McBroon has shown us how we could move some of the district lines around to at least get some equity. But this is not an exercise in moving kids right now and, 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 and dividing up neighborhoods. This is an exercise about seeing what's out there. It's bigger picture. And I think you know, uh, you know, we need to stress this both among the board clearly, but as well as with the community. I believe there will be a public hearing about this in, in the coming months. This will be a topic of conversation. This is not something that the strategic planning committee intended on pushing into action because we're talking about bigger things than just, you know, what are we going to do next? We are talking about this whole one Middletown concept and saying, how do we make long-term beneficial changes economically and educationally for the community? I think that, you know, when we met in the strategic planning committee, we talked about, as Nick said, um, this just being a first look um, at this, at these concepts for the board and the community. And we were going to have a discussion tonight about, um, you know, planning a community forum, I guess you would call it, um, you know, for either January or February to see, I know we sent out a date to the board, but I don't think that was ever shored up. So you know, just to talk to the board on um, on where they stand on having that um, that community meeting where we can have the community ask questions and you know get into to more details and get their perspective on. As Nick says, these are just concepts; these are ideas; these are definitely not you know a finalized um, you know 
pick, choose number one, two, three, or four, or none. I mean, this, this, is, a, this is a starting point for us. Yeah, and I think that um, Mr. Zuba made it very clear when he said that this is a high level presentation. And I mean, I just, on behalf of the committee and the board, I wanna thank you for such an excellent presentation. Um, it's got a lot of options here for the future board. Um, I'd like to make sure that we get this email to our new board members with those maps, with the details on them so that they can look at it as well. And I think that, um, Malona McBroom has really set up the next board for success with this. Um, you have many options from ones that don't make, you know, too much of an impact um, and too much change to all the way to like a five year um, I, I, idealistic place that you could go as well. So thank you. We will post this presentation on the website. Uh, along with the information from the agenda so everybody can take a look back at it and review it, you know, and get more familiar with it before we would have our next meeting. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah, thank you, Mike and Rebecca. Okay, it um, appears as though our student speaker from South is on. Great. Yeah, hi. So can we do that hi. now? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, well, first and foremost, I would like to apologize for my tardiness. This is not representative of Middletown High School South. It is representative of my clustered brain. No but worries. That said, Don't worry about it. No problem. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a pandemic snowstorm. I mean, yeah, let's, let's, call, let's call it that. Let's, blame let's it call on it that. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way. Um, I'll get started. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Maura Collins, a sophomore at Middleton High School South, landed an interview with South alumni Brian Lynch. Lynch is a successful writer in Hollywood whose credits include the movies Hop, Minions, and Secret Life of Pets 1 and 2. Uh, the interview will be released in the near future to be viewed by the public. Victoria Medal, Gianna Musa, and Victor Medal of the Latin Honor Society organized a blood drive, which will take place at the Lincroft Presbyterian Church on the 29th of December from 12 to 5 p.m. Students who donate blood will have the opportunity to receive community service hours. These three students deserve to be recognized for their initiative. Congratulations to the following athletes on the girls soccer team who have accomplished outstanding recognition for their efforts. Abby Doherty, for receiving first team all division and second team all shore. Megan Carragher for receiving first team all division, first team all shore and second team all group. And Katie Coyle, first team all division, first team all shore and first team all group as well as all state. Congratulations. Mr. Letson, student assistance coordinator at Middletown High School South has created a social media accounts for students who have selected the virtual instruction option to feel more connected to the day-to-day -day happenings at South. Register posts to Middletown High School South virtual learners Instagram and Twitter accounts include the academic A or B day schedule for the day, the daily announcements, any special announcements for the day or week, selected morning music selections and various photos around the school from trophy cases, sports banners, bulletin boards, signs, athletic fields, and et cetera. So I would like to take the opportunity to add some insider information as a student uh, at Middletown High School South and congratulate the, the students who have received their early decision acceptance into universities such as NYU, Boston College, and Boston University among several other prestigious uh, universities. Uh, in the nature of early decision, it is binding. Therefore, these students will be attending these universities. So congratulations to them. And on the athletic side of things, congratulations to Luke Albrecht for committing to play basketball at Marymount University. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. My name is Ty Shemi, and I wish you all a happy holidays. Thank you, Ty. Happy holidays to you too.
Thank you. Enjoy your night. Happy holidays, Ty. Thank you. Thanks, Ty. Okay, let's move on with our committee reports. Um, I guess we usually have technology now. Is Dave here? Yes. Good evening. Uh, I have two, two items on tonight's agenda for information only and technology. Um, the first one um, is security updates. As we continue in this virtual hybrid environment, um, securing our student inter internet use and their behavior in a more proactive way rather than reactive is becoming more of a necessity. So recently we upgraded to the newest beta version of our end-to-end -end student safety and device management securely. Um, this new version is now called Nucleus. Um, with this upgrade, we now have the access to additional features and tools that allow us more advanced control of their access. So for example, we now have the ability to create custom groups based on an individual student's needs to allow a more restrictive or less restrictive online experience. Um, this new group-based permissions allow us to immediately change a student's account um, to increase their experience online. And it greatly reduces the amount of time they would normally have to wait for that change to take effect. Um, the new, also new AVAMP location service module in Nucleus allows us to geographically pinpoint a device or user location when that user or device is flagged for a bullying or self-harm alert. Um, and finally, advanced reporting tools on both the district dashboard as well as the parent portal allow for a better, uh, more detailed insight to what's actually going on in students' online activity. Um, just as a reminder, as always, parents can continue to sign up for access to their child's uh, online activity and to securely parent portal and it's listed on our website under the technology section. The second uh, item I have for information is the security camera server upgrades. Um, since the expiration of warranty servers on a security camera vendor, uh, the technology department has been maintaining and managing the 22 servers that make up our district security system. Um, part of this maintenance has been a replacement upgrades of many of the SSD video storage drives in these servers. Um, all their failed or failing drives are regularly being replaced this way we can preserve the data on, on those servers and increase overall performance. Um, in addition, all the servers are in a, currently in the process of being upgraded to Windows 10 with the latest, uh, latest security updates. Um, at the current time, 15 of, 20, uh, of our 22 servers have been upgraded uh, and the schedules to have the remaining seven to be completed over winter break. The point of moving our servers out to Windows 10 is for, for obvious reasons. It allows us for better security. It allows the server better performance and greater reliability. Any questions? No, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to student services. Michelle Tiedemann. Hi, everyone. We have a couple of informational items. We had a, a Board of Ed Student Services Committee meeting on November 12th, how things are going. Um, during the COVID pandemic and the effect of different staff uh, coming and going and related services, how our special ed students are doing. An update on the NJIETA, that's the inclusion grants for Leonardo K-5 and Harmony Pre-K. Uh, things are going really well. We do meet with them twice a month for each school and we are currently in the stage of self-assessment we had a meeting with the Middletown Township Friends of Diverse Learners uh, between admin and the executives of MTFODL on December 8th. And we reviewed similar topics. We went over how the inclusion grant is going, um, how the virtual learning is going for our students. We did an update on the disproportionality that is being headed by Dr. Meg Young. Um, we went over the assessments, district-wide assessments, dyslexia screening, and assistive technology for students. I have a couple of voting items for you. We have a few students receiving home instruction, a couple of new out-of-district placements, and two settlement agreements on the voting agenda. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, could you um, go over how virtual learning is going for our self-contained students and special ed students? Sure, so there is a wide range because we have everything from special education students who have elected to be full virtual to those who have elected to attend just their cohorts all the way to our students attending five days a week. So there is a wide range. 
Um, it, it is going fairly well. There are definitely some issues, um, especially with related services. Our therapist moves from building to building, many of them. So if there's a quarantine, it often affects students in more than one building. We do have to switch to virtual related services, but we are keeping close watch on the NJDOE as we await guidance on compensatory services. Um, and once we get the guidance on that, so far all we've gotten is for those students who have graduated or aged out, we are keeping careful documentation of how the kids are doing, what services may or may not have been missed, how the regression or progression of each student, we'll be looking at that through the IEP teams. So I think it's going as well as it possibly can. The staff is really extending themselves, you know, very, very um, impressively. But we do know there will be some regression issues that we are keeping careful track of. All right, anyone have any other questions? All right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So next would be uh, finance and facilities. Thank you, Mrs. Rogers. Uh, the committee did not meet this month. Uh, we have a very light agenda. We only have one item under the finance agenda for this month, which is the Title I salary allocation adjustment that you see on the agenda. A uh, couple of other things that we have uh, that are in different areas of the agenda are the financial reports, which are under the business administrator's report uh, for the month of November and our bill list. Uh, we also have under the report of the superintendent, the establishment of a new scholarship. And I, you know, it, I can let you know that that's uh, being established by uh, Paul Hooker and Rally Cap Sports. Uh, for in memory of Nicole Bongiolati, and it will be a thousand dollar annual scholarship awarded to a student at High School South uh, in Nicole's memory. Uh, we also have the, it's under finance and facilities, but really incorporates the whole district. And uh, we have the New Jersey uh, CUSAC uh, District Performance Review, the DPR. Uh, we are uh, scheduled to be reviewed under CUSAC for this year. There has been some discussion about possibly postponing that uh, at the state level uh, or, or giving waivers for high performing districts, which we would qualify for that. But in the meantime, we are preparing as if uh, we will be reviewed. Uh, so there was a committee that met uh, with board representation, administrator representation, uh, teaching representation, other bargaining units to review uh, the scores uh, that we have to reflect for ourselves and hand into the state. Uh, so I, you know, in, I can tell you that we scored uh, well in all areas. Uh, over 80% is considered a good score. Uh, we have uh, we reached 100% in the different areas that are included in the in the. Uh, in the review, uh, there's personnel, uh, there's governance, there's uh, finance, there is operations, and there is instruction and program. And we had 100% in all of those areas, except for uh, we do have one exception in finance, which we have each time we're reviewed, uh, and it has to do with uh, the fact that you know we don't have 100% compliance across a district, and this is common with most districts. Uh, in the area of our purchase orders. Uh, we do sometimes have uh, things that are ordered uh, before the purchase order is done, so it's approved later. Uh, so that is one area that we, uh, most districts, you know, need to score themselves as not perfect. So that resulted in a, in a 94% or I'm sorry, 96% score for finance. And then uh, the, in the area of an instruction and program, uh, we do have some scores that are dictated to us uh, by the state, you know, with, with various uh, scores that are reported, you know, as performance scores in the district. I don't know if Mrs. Walker or Mrs. Pekus, if you want to add a little bit of detail to that, but that is another area where we did not score 100%, but we were high performing. Yes, it, those are the points that are, um, we automatically are assigned based on student performance on state standardized assessments. So that would be for English language arts, mathematics, as well as the new science assessment. And the way the state uh, 
calculated district scores for CUSAC this year is that because we did not have um, any assessments last year because of the suspension um, of those assessments due to the uh, closing, the going virtual, they went back to the 19, uh, I'm sorry, the 18, 19 school year. So um, each, there are many different factors, uh, overall student performance, subgroup performance, meaning um, like special education, uh, English language learners, uh, socioeconomically, uh, economically disadvantaged, uh, subgroups by uh, ethnicity or race um, are calculated. And in addition to that, there are other factors uh, besides just standardized assessment results. Also your um, attendance, which we did very well. We saw great improvements in that over our last time, um, which was the 17 school year, as well as our graduation rates. So I believe in the area of instruction and program, we finished with a score of 88%. That's correct. So as we said, we worked with the committee. Uh, we reviewed all of our scoring. Uh, we have a, a accumulated documentation. Uh, if they do proceed with the QSAC reviews, I think we are scheduled for some time in March uh, that we have to meet with the county superintendent and his staff to review all of our support for our scores. And we will apprise the board, you know, if and when that review goes through, you know, what the results of that were. So we're still waiting to see if that's going to move forward. Uh, but we need to submit this uh, by, by tomorrow. Uh, so it is on the board's agenda for approval of submission. Just the, just the, the, the district performance review scores, not, you know, in preparation for the QSAC review. We get to see that report? It's really just, it, it's just a, a summary of these scores, which we just report, you know, poured it on the 88%, the 96 and the 100%. That's all it is. Oh, so we don't get to see how you got those scores and, <laughs> and on what areas and what did you base your scores on? Well, there is, there is support to that. We can post to the portal, but it, it's these areas that we've been talking about. You either score yourself as in compliance or not. This was all reviewed with the committee and the committee signs off on it. Who was on the committee? Who was on the committee? Well, we had Mrs. Walker as the superintendent. Uh, I was on the committee. Uh, Mrs. Pekus for curriculum and instruction. Uh, we had Mrs. Rogers as our board representation. Uh, there were two teachers uh, Christina Requa and Michelle Koplinski and Mr. Ranella as district administrative staff. So that's all we had under facilities and finance. There's nothing listed on facilities as a voting, voting agenda item. Thank you, Amy. Can we move on to policy? Yes, we have several policies listed on the agenda for first readings this month. Uh, we also have the policies from last month uh, that we reviewed as first readings listed for second readings, uh, well, which we spoke about at last month's meeting. The policies for this month that we have listed uh, are all uh, policies that are, are mandatory policies for the district to have. Uh, they are uh, revisions that have been recommended to us by our policy consultant, Strauss Esme, uh, and we've made the appropriate uh, revisions to uh, the policies. Most of them are existing policies. There are a few new policies uh, that are uh, listed here, and those are noted on the agenda as new, such as the seizure action plan. Uh, I believe that is, uh, and also the heat participation policy for student and athlete safety. Uh, these policies, again, are things that are recommended changes because of changes in administrative code, statute, uh, update, updates and wording, uh, some additional requirements. Uh, they've all been posted on the portal uh, for the board to review. I don't know if there's any particular questions on a certain policy that we have listed. All of the changes were noted on the revisions that were in the portal. 
Can you, I know that there was one about vaccinations and I know that's kind of like a hot topic. Can you give a little clarification on that one, even though we're not voting on that one tonight? Sure. I'm actually going to ask if Mr. Kirkpatrick wants to talk about that. He was very involved in rev revising a lot of these policies with the guidance. Sure. You'll have to excuse me if I cut in and out a little bit. My internet is acting funny. I'm not sure if it's the weather and my children playing Xbox. <laughs> so the changes to the immunization policy and regulations have to do with the nurses reviewing immunization exemptions annually to confirm that the exempts the child still applies. So it's yearly making sure that these immunization um, exemptions are up to date and appropriate. That's the only change. That's the only change on the immunization policy and regulation. Okay, thank you. So it's pretty much what it was before. Correct. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, if there's no okay. other questions on these policies, yeah. we're certainly, if any questions come up between now and next month, uh, the first reading policies will be on for second reading and the second reading policies that we have tonight, uh, the board will take action on in the voting portion of the meeting. And these are available to the new board members as well, because they'll have to vote on it in January. Amy, so, your mic's not on. Are they, can they get on the portal or not till? Well, actually, I, the, the, these, re, these first reading policies will be on the public portion of the website. Okay. So anyone can see them. Thank you. Okay, moving on to curriculum and in, sorry, instruction. Tongue twister. <laughs> yeah. So we have a couple uh, updates, informational items, as well as uh, details to elaborate on some of our voting agenda items this evening. Uh, the first thing we just wanted to up apprise the board of is that we did finalize our new special subject class at the elementary level, the digital, digital literacy and design class which will be implemented when we return and resume our six day specials rotation at the elementary level. Um, we're really excited for this class to be launched. Uh, the teachers did a great job of integrating many different themes uh, in the curriculum, including digital cit citizenship, network design and internet, technology literacy, da data analysis, programming, uh, impacts of computing and information and media literacy. Uh, the specific content, the complexity of the activities, and the student expectations will obviously increase as the students move through the grade levels. And the focus of the units of study are all aligned with the 2020, the brand new, uh, recently released and adopted New Jersey Student Learning Standards in computer science and design thinking. Each unit will also include opportunity for students to improve their keyboarding and typing skills, which is something that we've heard over the years um, through different forms, PIC, through our strategic planning. It, we've gotten a lot of feedback from parents as well as teachers that this needs to be prioritized. We've done different things in the past to try to address it, um, but we're very pleased uh, to say that in this new course uh, at the elementary level, students will have sustained and frequent uh, opportunity to practice and improve upon those keyboarding and typing skills. Uh, so to that end, the curriculum department, we have purchased a district subscri subscription to Typing Pal uh, for, that will be used uh, with, with the K-5 students. And what we were able to negotiate is a subscription for every student in the district for this year. Uh, we are writing an article for the weekly newsletter as we speak. So there will be more information shared with parents. Teachers will also be sharing information with parents at all levels. Um, and uh, again, uh, Typing Pal incorporated those free subscriptions for all students K-12. Uh, this year for us. Um, we kind of negotiated that deal with them. So that is an informational update. Uh, this evening on the voting agenda, we have some curriculum committees that uh, are on one of the attachments, the curriculum attachment. And many of them are self-explanatory, but some of them, maybe not so much. They are classes, they're new classes that we have talked about over the last couple months, both at board meetings and at curriculum committee meetings. Um, so I just wanted to give a little bit more information about two of the courses, um, maybe they're not so uh, 
transparent in their title, let's say. So, uh, and this is lifted exactly from our new course enrollment uh, uh, selection guide that is going to be released in the next couple of days on our website. Because remember, we've talked about the fact that we're migrating it over to an interactive uh, platform on our website, that course selection guide. So our modern global issues honors class is a semester's course and students will be examining various global issues and actions that can be taken by countries or individuals to really combat and rectify um, issues that, that different countries and uh, subpopulations are facing around the world. The course will examine issues that fall within the theme, within social studies themes, such as political, economic, uh, religious, cultural, um, militaristic or military and um, social. So special attention will be paid to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and many districts are adopting, um, not adopting, but um, in integrating those goals into their course curriculums and how different countries are addressing these goals. Students will become more informed of what is occurring at the present time, both domestically in our own country and globally. And um, they'll have an opportunity to explore diverse perspectives and understand the interconnectedness of the modern world that we lived in, live in, because we are a global, global society. Uh, in the Power and Prejudice Honors course, that is also a semester's course, a semester course, students will be introduced to problems and causes of, and possible solutions to different actions and events that uh, may deny people their basic human rights, um, dignity, liberty, justice. It helps students develop awareness of the role of uh, prejudice through literature and history, and students engage in the analysis of fiction and nonfiction through the lens of race, ethnicity, gender, class. And it's an, an essential component of this course is the role and responsibilities of us as individuals, each person within their given society and the issues and the dilemmas that we all face. Um, I have to say, I, when I taught many, many years ago, 20 years ago in Freehold Regional, um, I taught a course very similar to this. And what I found very interesting is that um, now because of our uh, connections with post-secondary institutions such as Kane and Seton Hall, we've really been able to enhance um, our curriculum when it comes to these courses. So these courses are going to be offered as dual enrollment courses. Um, that means that students can earn college credit. And we did use course, curri uh, course curriculum components of the course curriculum from Seton Hall um, to help us design uh, the modern globals issues and the power and prejudice uh, curriculum that we will be uh, adapting and creating here in, in Middletown. And these two courses are gonna be replacing uh, a course that we used to run contemporary world geography that has had very low enrollment uh, over the past couple of years. So I just wanted to highlight those two courses. Um, again, we have curriculum committees on the agenda tonight, uh, teachers to begin uh, crafting and putting together that curriculum. Those are courses that will be offered next year and they are in the new course selection guide and they are electives. Um, there's other uh, curriculum committees on there. I think they're a little bit more self-explanatory. Uh, video game design, economics. Um, if, but if you have any questions, feel free, to, I'm more than happy to answer. Um, and I think the only other thing we wanted to just talk about tonight on the voting agenda is um, there is uh, the readoption of our evaluation models and rubrics. Um, this year, due to the ever-changing nature of uh, instruction, given the health emergency, public health emergency, uh, the New Jersey Department of Education gave us, gave all districts flexibility in how we have to uh, conduct and implement our evaluations for, with staff. Traditionally, the evaluations would all be done in the classroom with live in-person instruction. Um, given the fact that many districts ha have only been in virtual, uh, unlike us where we've been in-person and you know virtual, um, they, and because districts are shifting back and forth, uh, given, uh, you know, requirements for quarantining and such um, and closures uh, because of the New Jersey Department of Health guidelines, they are giving districts flex flexibility to do teacher evaluations, support specialist evaluations and administrator evaluations virtually. So they have given us very specific criteria. Uh, Mrs. O'Hagan has shared this information with all district staff 
Uh, she'll be updating them again. I know this week she's working on some more uh, information and details for them. And she has conducted training with all of our evaluators to ensure that they are uh, following and they're in compliance with the New Jersey Department of Education requirements. So it's a portfolio process um, if the teacher is teaching virtually when they are being observed and there are different components to it. But we are still using our Charlotte Danielson model that we have had in place since I believe it's 2012 or 2013 um, for our teacher and specialist uh, observations and the strong uh, rubric, strong model for our administrator evaluations. So those are on the agenda tonight to um, be readopted. And um, I guess I'll take any questions that anyone has. Kim, I have a question for you. I see the evaluation models under the superintendent to vote on it, under, his, under the superintendent's report. But where is the committee? Where do you have the committees to vote on? I don't see them on the agenda at all. Oh, the, it's an attachment. It's, um, it's an attachment on the personnel agenda, usually, the curriculum committees. Let me see if I can pull up my digital copy. It's on the personnel agenda that we're voting on it? Okay. Yeah, they're typically there. And it's, it's a lot, you know how like, we break out like- the, I yeah, see it, I see yeah. it. I just Thank don't know off the top of my head what number or Okay, what. I found it. It's number eight. Okay, thank you, Leonora, for that assist. You answered yourself. You. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, okay, but you I told me where to look. My That's all I wanted. <laughs> okay. So we're moving along and I just wanna put in a plug, remind everyone uh, the building administrators at both High School South and High School North along with the uh, curriculum directors have been working hard. Uh, we have our eighth grade open house tomorrow night. It's a virtual one. And it will also be a combined uh, information session on our high school academies and pathways. So we're gonna see how it goes. We're gonna try, to be, we're gonna try it virtually, um, but it, a lot of information will, will be shared tomorrow night. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Moving on to Pat Ranella with student activities. All right, good evening, everyone. We just have one voting agenda item and that is the appointment of Mr. Kirkpatrick as the district HIP coordinator, coordinator for the 2020-2021 school year. Great. And congratulations again. Um, we don't have anything for shared services tonight, just to say thank you to the Department of Health uh, for assisting Mrs. Walker during this global pandemic. Um, so helpful when we work together towards a common goal. Um, the town and the district are greatly appreciative of this collaboration. Thank you. Um, strategic planning, we did. So we're good. So committee's over. And... Okay, so we're just gonna move on to public comment on agenda items only. Remember we have a three minute limit and um, 30 minute total limit. So three minutes each. Okay, at this time, anybody who would like to make a comment um, can locate a virtual hand on your dashboard and click that icon that'll put you into a queue and we can bring you in the room, uh, into the room to ask your question or make your comments. It looks like we do have a hand up right now, and that is Stacy Jones. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Stacy. Hi, thank you. Uh, I wanted to speak to the agenda item of the uh, presentation of the plans. As someone who's attended all of the strategic planning forums, I was a little bit alarmed by some of the options presented here. Uh, there was a lot of discussion, and I want to quote from Forum 2 of Strategic Planning. Um, Pam Rogers, at an hour and 21 minutes, said, it's not going to be a surprise. It's going to absolutely fall in line with what you see at Forum 3, because that's where we're making our decisions from, the information that we're getting from the public. In all of the strategic planning meetings, the, both the administration and the board were there, um, and there was substantial discussion around 
with, with Dr. George at the time about whether there was conversations that had taken place with staff that were verified with staff about moving ninth and 10th grade into one high school and 11th and 12th into another. And as the public, we were assured at the time that that was not, it was like more of a general conversation first told it never took place, then it was general, it wasn't being implemented for 2021 to 22. Um, and then assured that that wasn't being considered. There was discussion about banding as a whole. Options three and four are basically banding the district. And both the administration and Mrs. Walker, you were present at these meetings, both the administration and the board assured the public that they heard loud and clear that they weren't interested in banding type options. There was a petition not supplied by me, but by another person in literally a packed house meeting that this had thousands of families in the district signed against bandings. And, and options three and all of the iterations underneath it and four are basically banding and changing the schools. So I feel as a parent in the district that I've spent the time to be present at all of these meetings. And we were told that things would be heard, but it was being done with public input and that these were not, banding was not something that you were going to um, wait, clearly waste resources on exploring because it was loud and clear that this was not something we were interested in. So there seems to me a huge disconnect between what was presented by the firm you hired, like were they even made aware of what was discussed in all the strategic planning forums and what you said and represented to the public that you know, understanding community schools are valued here. And a lot of parents are former graduates of the district who brought their kids back. And that the district as a whole was very adamantly against the idea of banding. But yet here I am months later and, and two out of the four options are exactly the things you told us as the public, we're not gonna be where your focus is. So I wanna know what kind of timeline are you looking at? Are you really considering options three and four that were presented here? Because that, that flies in the face of what you told us, you know, earlier in the year substantially and on recorded conversations that can be pulled up. So I, I, I think also I'm a little alarmed at the pace with, with, this, with which this is moving forward when everybody is clearly, you know, in the, in the throes of dealing with the pandemic and the health of their families. And this is something that does affect the entire community. And while I understand you have decisions to make for the district, if you're telling the district you're going to do one thing and you're not considering option B, then to come back with four options and two of them are option B flies in the face of everything you represent about transparency and about involving the public and listening to what that input was throughout the entire strategic planning forums that we all took time away from our families. Hey, miss, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. Excuse me, but you're three minutes up. Could you please maybe complete your thoughts so we can move on to the next speaker? Thank you. Thank you. I think I've said what I need to. So thank you all for your time. Happy holidays to everyone. But I, I, I do hope that you will consider everything that I said. Thank you. Hey, Mrs. Rogers, I'm just going to jump in and, and respond. I want to re reiterate to the entire community, everybody who's online, everybody who's on YouTube. I know we have some folks watching on YouTube. What Malone and McBroom presented to us were not options. And they were specifically not called options. They were called concepts. They were called concepts because they were meant for the community to discuss and consider. We made a very conscious choice to ask Malone and McBroom to think creatively about how to use our current buildings, as I said before, considering the economic and educational future of our community, the fact that we have dwindling resources, a surplus of buildings, and we have, uh, you know, needs in every building is reflected by our long-term facilities plan. So everything that Malone and McBroom gave us on this plan, we asked for. Grade banding, as discussed in the conversations in strategic planning, which are on the record, and I am on the record on those meetings, was discussed at the elementary and middle levels. Moving to a K to six, seven to nine, and uh, 10 to 12 model is not grade banding. And I believe 
the K-6 model is consistent with the licensing and certification approach that the state of New Jersey takes where elementary school teachers, I believe again, are certified or certificated, I see Mrs. Peek is nodding, from K through six. So we would be consistent with the state of New Jersey model. We are not considering, say, a K to two, a three to four, a five to six, you know, moving kids, say, from Lincroft to Nut Swamp to, uh, to River Plaza. That was what was discussed during strategic planning. That is not on the table. So I want to reiterate to the community that we did listen. The rubric that Malone and McBroom, that Malone and McBroom showed on every option shows the strategic planning goals and how every, I'm sorry, concept and how every concept scored against those goals. So we took the community's feedback into consideration on every single concept. So I think it's very clear. These are concepts. There's no timeline. We are not pushing anything ahead quickly. As a matter of fact, as was mentioned, this will be discussed by the community at a future meeting. So I want to reassure the community that this is not the board and not, you know, three outgoing board members trying to rush through any sort of a change. This is a very methodical stepwise process that we believe we've set the future board up to continue along in a very thoughtful manner. Well said, Nick. Um, we're gonna move on to uh, a motion. I need a motion to approve. Wait, I think the there are, more, are there more people? Oh. Yes, we have two oh, more Oh, sorry, Chris, raised. I thought you said we have yeah. one. Um, next, we have Rachel Kanopka. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank Malone and McBroom for the thoroughness of the presentation. Um, having gone to all the strategic planning sessions and also just board meetings in general for the past four or so years, I know that this has been a long time coming to kind of get to the point where we combine the concepts with some data and lay it all out. And I think this was a very good kind of starting point heading into 2021. Um, it was just some of the, the options, I won't call them options, some of the concepts were very interesting to me. They're not things that I had kind of thought of myself and I know they hadn't been formally discussed. So I think it's important for all of us, members of the public, parents and administrators and board members to be able to see the full menu of what we could do so that we can have more confidence in whatever it is we end up doing down the road. Um, so I recognized kind of some of the banding uh, implementation that was included in this and I kind of raised my eyebrows a little bit too, but I also think it's very important for us to consider all of this in order to know that whatever we do decide, we, we feel confident that we pick the right one. You wanna look at the full universe before you, you pick where you're going. So I appreciated that. Um, one of the big things I think that we have to figure out, obviously, is costing estimates. I think some of those options um, will cost significantly more than others. And I'm curious, I, I apologize, I missed the very, very beginning of the presentation, um, but when would the costing estimates happen and who would be providing them? Is this a matter where the, the board and the administration would kind of use public feedback coming from the forum and then narrow down what we think people would like and then get it all costed out? Or is it gonna be costed out before we evaluate it? Because I think you know, a $100 million solution versus a, a $2 million solution, that, that's a really big difference and it should be factored in when the public is responding um, would be my request. So that was one thing on that. And then I just wanted to comment on two quick other things. Uh, one is to say thank you for the, the increased focus on the keyboarding skills at the elementary level. Um, I know I spoke at a meeting a while ago about that because I still have a hunt and pecker. Um, so I think that that's huge. I think that will benefit our kids leading in, you know, to their, their adult lives very, very much. So thank you for doing that and for kind of helping to play catch up with the kids who maybe didn't have as much keyboarding as elementary students. I think that will help too. Um, and then my other comment slash question has to do with the evaluation process. At a PIC meeting last year, I can't remember which month, um, but Mrs. O'Hagan went through kind of a little bit about the evaluation process and also the tenure process in our district right now. And one of the things that I commented on, and I think some others did too, was if there was an opportunity to incorporate student feedback and maybe to a certain degree, even parent feedback um, as part of the evaluation, specifically to address the teachers who are doing a tremendous job. And I think maybe people aren't as inclined to send positive emails about a staff member as they are to send concerns. And I think that might be something that would help if, if there was a more formalized use of student feedback or parent feedback when teacher evaluations 
um, or specifically tenure um, considerations are done. That's it. Thank you guys very much. Happy holidays. Thanks. Okay, Happy holidays. Is, Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, it's okay. Next is, uh, is John Chalette. Good, day, good evening, Board of Education members, Mrs. Walker, Mr. Taylor, Mrs. Doherty, district administrators. Uh, my name is John Chalette. I am the president of the Middletown Township Education Association. I am here this evening to publicly present to you the results of the association's ratification vote of a one-year extension of our collective bargaining agreement. The members of the association have overwhelmingly voted to ratify the contract. There were 587 yes votes and, one, and 18 no votes for a total of 605 votes cast totally. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. I'm not seeing any more hands raised at this time. Okay. So now I would like to make a motion to approve the minutes from our executive session on November 18th, 2020 and our regular voting meeting on November 18th, 2020. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions? Um, so we have one abstention, Mrs. Minuiz. Amy, I can't see you. Did you get that? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, for my report of the president this evening, I'd like to say uh, wish a very happy holidays to all of our Middletown Township families. Um, I know that this year won't be the same as usual, but hopefully we'll make some new um, traditions this year going forward and hope for next year to be back to our traditional holidays again. Um, I would also like to um, wish our teachers a very happy holiday. And um, I think we've learned now more than ever how valuable our teachers are. Uh, this board definitely values them. And I would like to thank uh, Mr. Chillette for a very pleasant um, negotiation um, season, I'll call it. We had what, four or five months of this. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve the agreement, um, the memorandum of agreement between the Middletown Township Board of Education and the Middletown Township Education Association, please. So moved. Seconded. Discussion. This is Rogers. If I terms. May, oh, thanks, Mr. Taylor. <laughs> no problem, Mr. Franco. If I may, uh, Mr. Rogers and board members, give a brief summary. Um, for yes, the, please. Uh, and community. Um, essentially, the uh, Middletown Board of Education and the Middletown Education Association are parties to a four-year uh, contractual agreement uh, pursuant to New Jersey law, a teacher's contract, um, a uh, education association contract uh, can be a maximum of five years. Uh, pursuant to Article 3.13 of the current collective bargaining agreement, which expires on June 30th, 2021, there is a specific provision regarding health benefits. Um, essentially uh, what's commonly referred to as uh, Chapter 78 relief. Uh, the Board of Education in prior years voted to uh, give the union uh, members uh, who accumulated a certain number of years of service a $1,000 uh, uh, incentive payment, so to speak. Um, that is commonly referred to as, it doesn't say in the contract, but what it is is Chapter 78 relief. Uh, that $1,000 payment uh, totals about $250,000 uh, for this current school year. Um, and that amount is projected to go up as more members elevate into that higher level. Um, so with that um, provision in the contract, uh, pursuant to the school uh, employee benefits plan, which became effective July 1, 2020 oh. for new employees uh, and January 1, 2021 uh, for all current employees, unless they opt out, um, that basically triggered uh, Article 3.13, a change in health benefits and the requirement for the parties to reopen the contract to negotiate. Um, I'm happy to report uh, that uh, with the board's authorization, the committee was able to negotiate a fair and reasonable 
uh, reopener of the contract and extension of the contract. This is not a new agreement. This is an extension of the current agreement, um, whereby that article has been essentially or will be eliminated effective July 1, 2021. Uh, uh, no employees will be eligible to receive that $1,000 payment, which will essentially net at least a $250,000 payment uh, for the 2021 22 school year and every year thereafter for the Board of Education. Uh, the parties tentatively agreed and has been ratified by the union uh, for the one year extension period, making it a five year contract. Again, not a new agreement, but a five year existing agreement um, of a 3.25% salary increase, inclusive of increment for professional employees, and a 4.25% increase, inclusive of increment for secretarial employees. It's important to note that the current agreement um, has a 3% per year increase for uh, teaching staff members, professional staff, and a 4% increase uh, for secretarial staff. So the extra quarter percent does not deviate substantially, at best minimally, from the current uh, increase pattern you have. Um, but yet again, you are netting a $250,000 annual savings uh, by uh, negotiating out that $1,000 incentive payment. Uh, there also is a language change uh, in the contract, adding language uh, regarding uh, the Workplace Enhancement Democracy Act. Um, that's a, a statute that became effective about a year or two ago, uh, which in a nutshell gives the union uh, the right to have access to certain information of new hires and existing employees that are employed within the bargaining unit, name, address, personal email, work email, et cetera. Um, also, uh, limited time for the union, uh, particularly at the beginning or commencement of employment, uh, to meet with uh, new members, um, a minimum of 30 minutes, maximum of two hours, with no loss of pay, uh, to inform the members of the different benefits, rights, privileges, et cetera, of union membership. Um, those are the three primary uh, revisions, uh, the length of the contract, adding one year, the salary, um, as well as the Workplace Enhancement Democracy Act, and again, the elimination of the $1,000 insurance. Uh, that summarizes the extension, um, which will give you a five-year contract. Um, Madam President, I'll turn it back over to you. Mr. Taylor, I have a question. Um, because we're adding a year onto the four-year deal to go to five, does that mean, can another one-year deal be made next year, or does the whole contract have to be renegotiated next year for a minimum, I guess, three-year deal? How does that work? Well, the, the, the next year would essentially be 2022-23. Um, mm -hmm. So it wouldn't really, nothing would have to happen next year because you'll be under contract for another year. Um, right. Thereafter, generally speaking, uh, contracts are typically between three to five years, almost similar to a superintendent contract. Um, there are occasions when a contract, let's say, expires. So let's say theoretically on June 30th, 2022, the parties aren't able to reach a successor agreement and, and you find yourself in 2024 and you've been negotiating for two years. Um, so the contract is expired. Um, notwithstanding it being expired, the teachers are still protected by the same terms and conditions of the expired agreement. But because you're now limited to a three, four or five year contract, sometimes what happens is the parties will agree to a retro contract for a year or two and then a five year period going forward which arguably gives you a seven year contract, but it really is, a, it's really two separate agreements. That's one way to look at um, uh, the example you uh, framed, Mr. Franco. Thank you. So, so in other words, there are no other changes to the contract, no other wording changes. What you said is the only changes there are. Yes, ma'am. Okay, now I have another question. Um, what administration sat on the negotiating team? Uh, Ms. Um, Kim Pekus sat in on behalf of the administration. As you are aware, the superintendent and business administrator have conflicts due to having relatives employed in the district. When did that happen? I don't know when it happened, but you're aware of that, and that's not relevant. No, I know. Excuse me, Mr. Teller. I wasn't aware that Mrs. Gallagher was not able to be at the table. She's always been at the table. Okay, well, she wasn't now. Um, however, pursuant to law, she did and was able to provide financial information and calculations, just not at the table, but with respect to background due to the key high-level position she holds in the district. Every number has been checked and cross-checked by Ms. Uh, Doherty, 
with respect to her role as business administrator for the Middletown Public Schools. And what, what board members were at the last meeting? The negotiations committee, ma'am. Um, I believe everyone except for Mr. Jaimo. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And just so we're clear, it was Mrs. Rogers, uh, Mrs. Wright, and uh, um, Mr. Dalman, just for the record is clear. And Mr. Jaimo was prepped before and after and uh, was also briefed after the fact. And then all of the board members were briefed after the fact uh, via text, via email, via phone call. Um, Mrs. Doherty, can you please reiterate how much this uh, extension on the contract will save the district? Because I know it's already under some criticism from the press. Amy? I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. I mean, it, it the, you know, the savings, uh, you know, I, I guess is what Mr. Taylor was talking about would be in the insurance payments that were eliminated right. from the contract. You know, the, that language that provided for those service payments for these uh, staff members who are on step 19 or above in the teaching staff and step 17 uh, for the secretarial staff, uh, those are being eliminated. And I think as uh, Mr. Taylor mentioned, uh, the, that savings will actually increase each year because we each year will you know we have more staff members moving up to those steps. I mean, Mr. Taylor said uh, a savings of about two hundred and fifty thousand. We're actually projecting you know for next year that it would be you know slightly higher than that. So as more as more staff members move on to those steps. And if I may also, Mrs. Rogers, just add that. Um, one of the, uh, I guess, tenants that were expressed by the uh, MTEA, Mr. Chalette and his leadership team, but also the board members and one of the, the key components of, of, of labor law, um, in, in essence, is labor harmony. Um, in these unprecedented uh, times of the pandemic, uh, the, the board, um, by uh, its consideration of this proposed uh, extension of, of the current agreement, um, recognizes the hard work and dedication of the teaching staff in your district. Um, as well as the support staff that are within that unit. Um, it provides a sense of stability in very unstable times um, and allows the educators and administrators to focus on educating the children in your school district rather than negotiating a successor contract at some later time. So it's something that, that does significantly help build and boost morale, both of your uh, members covered by the union contract, but also your administrators. Agreed. Okay, are there any more questions from the board about the contract? Okay, so- um, Would it be a roll, we'll call vote? roll call vote? Yeah, let's do a roll call vote. Okay, on item number one under report of the president, the resolution to approve the memorandum of agreement between the Middletown Township Board of Education and the Middletown Township Education Association. Mm -hmm. Uh, the motion has been moved and seconded. Uh, roll call, Mrs. Caminiti. Yes. Mr. DeFranco. Thank you very much to our teachers and our staff members in this contract, yes. Mr. Donlin. Yes. Mr. Jimo. Yes. Mr. Little. Yes. Mrs. Minuiz. I'm sorry, you're muted, Mrs. Minuiz. I would like to thank our teachers for all of their hard work. I'm going to vote yes, but I'm not happy with the lack of information and the lack of timing that we got the memorandum of agreement at 5.30 tonight. Mrs. Wright? I vote yes. Mrs. Stella? Definitely yes. Mrs. Rogers? Yes, thank you to my kids' teachers, especially who have eyes in the back of their head with this hybrid uh, learning model. Um, absolutely, yes. Thank you. Excuse me, Mrs. Rogers, may I just make one more point of clarification with respect to the process? Um, just, um, uh, you know, the, the MTEA, as well as the, your administration, Mrs. Pekus in particular, um, work diligently um, on this process, as well as the entire committee. Um, the board, in an effort to be as transparent as possible, posted 
uh, the uh, approval of the MOU on the agenda as of Friday, last Friday. Um, based upon it being a personnel and contractual negotiation matter, it is not and would not have been appropriate to put the terms of the tentative agreement on the agenda. However, out of an abundance of transparency, they put as much as possible, they being the board, um, through the leadership of Mrs. Rogers on the agenda. Um, it's also important to note that the timing of the board members receiving the MOU is directly related to the fact that we were in negotiations up to and through about 2 p.m. this afternoon finalizing the language of the MOU, um, specifically regarding one of the uh, provisions in it for the Workplace Enhancement Democracy Act. Um, Mrs. Pekas and I had a conference call with John Chalette, um, his uh, uh, vice president, forgive me, I can't recall his name at this point in time, and Lorraine Tesoro on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. It lasted until about 11.15 a.m. negotiating and finalizing the uh, last provisions. The MTEA worked diligently to schedule a special session over the weekend, they met on Monday and they ratified the contract yesterday, um, subject to us finalizing the language. So the, the quote unquote lack of information, the, the board and the committee had all the information um, subject to finalizing some of the legality of the terms. Um, once we did that, it was sent over to the board members and administration. Thank you, Mrs. Rogers. Sure. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's move on to the report of the business administrator, the board secretary. Um, I need a motion to approve uh, numbers one through four. So moved. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstentions. I need a motion to approve. I'm sorry, Mary Ellen, did you have a report? Yes, I did have a, a report. Sorry. I just wanted to talk a little bit about phase five of our reopening plan. Um, this past Monday, we're very happy that we were able to start implementing our phase five plan, which um, phase five gives the opportunity for students who are learning virtually um, from the beginning of the year to um, come back and, and, or actually not even come back, they haven't been here, to enter the classroom and participate in um, instruction in per person on campus. So we had been trying to um, start, you know, implementing this phase for, um, you know, two months, I think, or a month. We, well, it's two months, we skipped a month, so it's been two months. And, um, you know, going all in was, was going to be difficult, so we broke it up to a more gradual increase in the number of students coming in at one time. So on Monday, we had some of our students start, and um, the rest of the students have the opportunity to begin. Anyone who didn't begin this Monday will have the opportunity to begin in-person instruction the first week in January that we are back to in-person instruction. So those parents will be getting a call from um, someone in the school. Um, you know, we need that information to help teachers prepare for the students and that call will also help the, uh, the parent understand, um, you know, the schedule and, and different things that are going on in the classroom to help the transition of the student back in the classroom. So as I said, we were very happy to be able to move in that direction, um, to move forward with our reentry plan, which had stalled for a while. Um, now we're going to continue after we get this implemented in January. We'll, you know, in the beginning of January, we'll begin to, um, you know, look at the health data in terms of how we can move forward with, um, with lunch and, and phase six. Um, so that's to come. Hopefully we can keep moving along at a, you know, at a pace that, you know, keeps our schools open. It doesn't go too fast and, and causes us to close. Our goal is to keep our schools open and our goal is also to get all of our students back. And our goal is also to get everybody back full time. So um, we're moving in that direction and that's, um, you know, that's, that's a good thing. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, how we can, we're continuing to work um, to make sure we have the appropriate staff in our classrooms every day. We have the updated quarantine protocols that we have to follow because now we are in the, um, the high risk, um, it's, it's in the COVID matrix, we're in the high risk um, level, it's for COVID activity. And uh, the quarantining requirements when you're in there um, 
individuals, it's not just in the school, it's, it's in the school, it's in the community. If you are close contact to someone who has symptoms, you are supposed to quarantine. It used to be you had to quarantine if you were in close contact to someone who was positive. Now it's for symptoms and it, it, it helps stop the spread because it takes people out of, it lets somebody know that they're possibly, um, you know, they could have, they could have been exposed and let them know so that they're not around other people at that point, rather than waiting five days after, you know, they've ex been exposed to somebody and that test comes back that it's positive and they've been out maybe visiting a grandparent or, you know, coming to school or whatever. So it's helpful in terms of stopping the spread, which helps keep our schools open. Stopping the spread helps keep our schools open. But what it does is it, the, the side effect basically is more people are getting quarantined than ever before. More individuals, because there's more symptomatic people than there are positive people, because not everybody that's symptomatic ends up to being positive. So now we're quarantining someone who's close contact of someone who's positive and someone who has symptoms. And that is causing you know, us to have um, challenges every day in terms of staffing in our classrooms. Um, you know, this is uh, just, just a side effect. You know, staff aren't able to get into a classroom if they're quarantined. They're, they're, not, they're not allowed to come back in. So, you know, our, our, our staff is being flexible in helping us out, our teachers, our administrators, um, you know, whether they're the building administrators and our central office administrators and our HR department are working every day to make sure our classrooms are staffed. It gets very challenging on some days. I mean, it gets, it's challenging every day. Some days this morning was a little bit challenging. Um, but with teamwork, everybody's getting it done. And I also want to thank the parents for being so supportive and understanding in this challenging times and also our students who are being very flexible and, um, and resilient really. So thank you everybody, um, for helping us get through this. Um, I also wanted to tell you the township is, um, the, you know, Middletown township has invited um, the school community to uh, participate in a pre-holiday COVID-19 testing event. Um, the event is going to be at the primary lot in the Middletown train station, right off Middletown Lincroft Road. There's going to be no out-of-pocket pocket costs for participants. If you have insurance, they'll take insurance, but if you don't, it's for free. You, no one will pay anything. Um, these are not the instant tests. These are the PCRs, um, which take uh, longer to get, but the lab that's working with them um, will be processing them quickly and you will get the results in about three days. They urge you to pre-register so you can go onto the township site and download the form or you can do it on your phone from there. Um, the testing is on Friday, this Friday, from one o'clock to seven o'clock. Um, they made it after school so that families and teachers can go. Um, it's also gonna be on Saturday and Sunday from 9 a.m. to 3 a.m., all right? And any information more than that, you can find that on the Middletown Township website. And then lastly, I know a couple of people already, uh, you know, uh, talked about this, but I think it's important to say again, the High School Pathways and Academies Night and eighth grade open house are tomorrow and it's for incoming ninth graders. Um, it'll be from six to seven for incoming high school North families and 7.30 to 8.30 um, for incoming high school South families. Um, I'd just like to, to finish up by, you know, thanking our staff, thanking our administrators, thanking our board for their support, thanking our families and our students, um, you know, helping, working together, being supportive, being understanding to, to get us through. Um, I wish everybody a very peaceful and joyous holiday and break. I think we all need a break. Um, and then we'll come back in January and hopefully hit the road running and never stop. That's it. Thank you, Mrs. Walker. You're welcome. All right, I need a motion to approve C two through eight, please. So moved. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I'm opposed on number three and number eight. I'm voting no for number eight. 
Abstentions? Okay, I need a motion to approve B1 through three. Motion. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. For policy, I need a motion to approve the second reading. So that's um, D2. So moved. Second. Discussion. I just want to raise something oh. just, just really quick. So it, as part of this, I think it was policy number 7510, what we discussed last time, which was the proposed addition for the community political groups. That's being struck from this, right? Correct. Yes. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And thank you to the board for keeping politics out of the school. All right. Um, all in favor? Did we do that already? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Um, I need a motion to approve F1. So moved. So moved. Seconded. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. And abstentions? Um, on to the addendum for personnel. We've got, um, I need a motion to approve numbers one through 15. So moved. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Moving on to old business. Uh, if there's no old business, I'll move on to new business from the board. Uh, Mrs. Rogers, I have an item. Sure. Um, I just um, I just wanted to say thank you um, as an outgoing board member uh, to our to my fellow board members. Uh, you guys, uh, all eight uh, men and women that I'm working with here, are just dedicated, um, involved knowledgeable. Um, there's an institutional memory on this board that, that will continue. Um, and I think that you're poised to do great things going forward. Um, Mrs. Walker and the administration, thank you so much. Um, I've learned more about public education in the last three years than I ever thought I would learn. Some of it I can't believe. Um, but um, you are all tireless workers uh, with nothing but the best uh, for our children. Uh, at heart and the hours that you put in are go far beyond what any average member of the public would know without actually paying attention. It's incredible the amount of work you all do. So just thank you. Um, this has been a great experience for me um, and I look forward to all of you doing great things. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Pam, Nick. Pam uh, Nick and Robin, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for being such, uh, such great colleagues um, through the you know the agreements, disagreements, the old conversations, and and the amount of work that you put in over the last years, it's been a pleasure. Um, you know, and I you, you know I can only say that uh, you know all the decisions and all the things that you talked about come from your heart, and I think we, we, from what you think is right in general, and uh, I always appreciate that. And uh, you know, I miss you guys, and hopefully see you guys around still. Um, so um, thank you very much. I'll still call you and bug you, John. Listen, uh, Nick, Robin, Pam, just want to say thank you very much for all the collaboration, the hard work, the ideas, the innovation. And you know what? You'll be back somewhere. Robin, you'll still be working in the schools. <laughs> yep. And I'm sure Nick and Pam will still continue to support the community. Thanks, Mike. Forever friends. Yep. Thank you, Mike. That's right. This is not goodbye. We'll still all be friends. It's just, um, you know, we won't be working together as much at 7 p.m. at committee meetings every night. <laughs> I'm sure we'll still be involved. I got to be honest, life. I lost my connection for a little bit there. 
I don't know what's really what's going on. Are we um, ready to move on to public comment? I believe so. I don't know. Yes. Okay. okay. Again, um, um, let's open for public comment, three minutes each, 30 minute limit. Okay, anybody who would like to make a comment just as before um, on your dashboard, you will select the hand icon, go into a queue and we will bring you into the room uh, in order. Um, we will start with Stacy Jones. Hi, I just wanted to add one or two things to my comment earlier on the agenda item. Um, again, thank you all for your work and you know, thank you to the three board members who are outgoing for all of your hard work over the past few years as well. I, I wanted to also say um, with regard to 3B that was presented by the firm, and I know you're saying these are options, not plans and et cetera, but presenting a plan that consolidates the two high schools into one building and puts 3,026 students in one building um, when you already have looking beyond cost and infrastructure and, you know, academics, when you already have in place a scenario where you have very competitive spaces available for sports and clubs. I mean, my high school aged daughter in South last year was a member of the key club. They had a meet in the auditorium as it was, cause it was so huge things in, that practically make it very difficult for the students to participate in those co-curriculars and extracurriculars and things that round out the high school experience really need to be considered before you look at an option like that, because you're, you're talking about tremendous size. You're going to have one, you know, varsity soccer team with however many 12 or 20 players, you have 3000 students, how many students are going to want to play that can't and even beyond sports, just everything. Um, and I wanted to also speak to the idea of, um, shifting the grades seven to nine as the middle and 10, 10 to 12. Um, I know Nick responded to my earlier comments specifically that this, you know, the pre-K to six and how they're certified. Um, but it is a, a radical change from the district structure as a whole. And especially at the high school level, um, talking about consolidating buildings, shifting the sending zones, changing so that the entire district again meets at the the seven to nine level um, and they're all in one place essentially creates the same issues that I was just talking about at the high school level with all the co-curriculars and you already have that issue with the middle school is split in three where not all kids can get on a team and not all kids can participate in an activity because of the size and that's a third of what some of these proposals are um, so you really need to consider it as a whole and in terms of the impact on the students not just addressing the class sizes and what you know, you want how you want to shift the buildings, but the true day to day experience of these kids and the families and the bus time getting from A to B when some of these kids have community schools now and would then be everyone would have to go to north for grades seven to nine. Um, they just seem very radical. And I, I hope that you really consider and present to the public with a lot of time for comment and uh, and a lot of input that's truly considered. And with that, I'll wrap up and say thank you for all your hard work through the pandemic, trying to keep the students in class um, and trying to you know, get the, the phases moving forward uh, and for all the work you guys do behind the scenes, it's appreciated. Okay, next is Vera Paisecki. Hi, Vera Pasecki, um, Eshire Drive, Middletown. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to comment on some of the communication or um, um, what has been happening. I, I, I know both of the high schools have pivoted to virtual, but before that there appeared to be um, um, people were allowed who were opting hybrid to move their kids virtual um, through the holidays. Um, um, although uh, some 
teachers told my son and their friends that if the child didn't show up, they just marched, marked them virtual present. Um, I, I understand if it's through the holidays, but I feel like the communication has to be better um, to know who's actually gonna be hybrid and who's actually gonna be virtual. Um, because I think there's a presumption that you can, if you're hybrid, you can just go virtual whenever you want. Um, and there's no way I'm going to get my son or his friends back in when they're sitting in a classroom with one or two or three other kids. So if we can make sure that the communication is clear on that, particularly going into the new year. Um, also, the other communication, um, some teachers say the plexiglass is optional, some say it isn't, some. Um, so I, I just think as things have changed that maybe we just need to firm up um, the communication on some of the things that have, um, have been changing. Um, and um, otherwise, I don't know how you go forward and plan. Currently, I, I mean, given the attendance that was happening at South um, uh, last week before they went virtual, you could have combined both co cohorts and let them gone five days a week. There were so few people in there. So, um, so thank you, everybody have a great holiday. Appreciate all the work. Thanks. Not seeing any more hands raised at this time. Oh, there's oh, one. No. Sorry. Uh, Marguerite Stalker. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say I'd like to thank Robin, Pam, and Nick for their tireless hours devoted to the students of Middletown. Their leadership of and commitment to our community represents the best of Middletown. You will be missed. Joan, Lenora, Tom, Mike, Deborah, I look forward to your continued leadership moving forward. On a different note, um, at the start of this meeting, there was a um, mention of a lawsuit. Can someone please uh, elaborate on that? Mrs. Rogers, uh, the lawsuit was discussed in closed executive session. Uh, it's pending litigation, um, and the uh, board cannot uh, comment on the litigation at this time. Okay, next we have uh, Karen. I don't have the last name at this point. We will ask for one. Hi, it's Karen Fierbacher. Um, I was just wondering about um, with the virtual, it's, it's the phases are taking such a long time and, and a lot of delays. I mean, at this point we thought we were gonna be in full time and I completely understand why we're not and I get it and I appreciate all the hard work and all the considerations are taking to place for the safety of our students and faculty. Um, but if we're, we're going virtual, we have these planned virtual days I just feel like the kids aren't getting a full education being half day for so long. Is it possible to maybe when we go virtual, we're home all day, but maybe we could have a full day or longer days just so they get more instruction. I just hear the frustration. I mean, when I'm home, my kids are, you know, online, I can hear the frustration of the teachers that they're not getting, they don't have enough time. I just feel like the kids aren't getting enough time. So I don't know if that's just being considered since it's, taking so long, we don't know how long it's gonna be before we can actually get to a full day because of you know, in dining and stuff like that. So maybe that could be considered, I don't know. Thanks. Okay, not seeing any more hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, just one more time before we go, I want to thank the MTA for reaching out to the board in August, September to reopen the contract um, and keeping in mind the insurance provision uh, to being open-minded um, over the past several months. And of course, to the teachers, the staff, the administration, thank you for going above and beyond for our children. Uh, very, very happy holidays. And with that, I'd like a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Seconded. Discussion. I beat your mic. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Merry Christmas. Abstentions. Yep. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, everybody. Yep. Bye, guys. Yeah.
Happy holidays. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.